Please let me say this quickly. I don't want to take much time with this, but I will tell you a quick story. Um, you, many of you know, and, and I want to thank you ahead of time for all those of you who have sent cards to my wife. Uh, some of you have just extended such great uh, blessings to her, and I so appreciate that. So many of you know that she hasn't been with us for the last few weeks uh, because of her back surgery. I get into a, a kind of a, a routine of doing things, and sometimes I don't even realize what I'm doing. So in this series, I've kind of been going with the theme, you know, everybody needs a Goliath. Everybody needs a Jonathan. Everybody needs a Nathan. That's been my theme. And that's the way I've been kind of following this series. And so I just went along with that and I said, everybody needs a Bathsheba. Okay, so if you haven't got that yet, let me explain. I took my wife out to our doctor's appointment on Friday for our checkup. And on the way home, my wife was passing by the sign, and she said, what is that? And I said, what's what? She go, I go, that's the message for next Sunday. She goes, everybody needs a Bathsheba? <laughs> hmm. She looked at me, and she said, you don't need a Bathsheba. <laughs> so I tweaked the sign, but I kept the message the same. And here's the deal. Technically, we do need a Bathsheba. There are experiences, temptations that we go through that because of those temptations, they draw us closer to the Lord. We're going to talk about that today. We talked about Bathsheba a little bit when we talked about Nathan. Today, we're going to go into just a little bit more, and we're going to talk today about this, this picture of David and Bathsheba in, in one night, in one situation, one, one shortcoming, one act of sin— David made a choice, made a decision that cost him big time. It cost him in a way that he probably never realized that it would cost him. It would be a decision that would cost him two lives. The life of Uriah the Hittite and the life of an unborn child that would be conceived because of the sin. It was a thing that if you can imagine David on that night... He never dreamt that, that that one decision would cost him so much. But it did. And the thing about Satan, and I, and I think we all know this, but the thing about Satan is that he is the master of covering up the consequences for our sins. Because in the moment, he, he gives us this look of whatever it is that we're about to, to enter into is really no big deal. And he gives us all kinds of reasons why it's okay. Everybody else is doing it. You don't have to worry about it. You're not going to get caught. No one's going to know. And we never see it until it's too late. Just like David, he didn't see the consequences of the sin until it was too late. And so often we exchange God's blessings for a lie. And you wouldn't think that we would do that. But we do it all the time. And today, that's what we're going to talk about. How we deal with the causes of temptation, and then we're going to have the cures of temptation. So if you kind of want to head this in your notes, we're going to start with the causes of temptation, and then we're going to end with how do we correct those temptations, and how do we to correct those things that, that we do in our lives that are temptations. I'd like to start this morning with a story. It's a true story about a young man who went to kind of a, a, a flea market, if you will. It was a kind of a, a mom and pop store, and he saw this old, rusty, really depleted Harley David and motorcycle. And the guy who owned the store told the guy who was looking at it, he says, hey, if you want to trade me a couple things, I'll give you the Harley. He says, but it's going to take a lot of work to get it out here because it's kind of stuck. It's not, it's, 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 it's kind of at that place where it's been sitting for so long, you're going to have to lift it. You're going to have to get something to bring it out. You can't push it. And the guy said, I'll make that trade with you. I'll take that Harley Davidson for hardly nothing. It, was, it equaled out to be about a hundred bucks worth of stuff that he traded for this old Harley Davidson. He gets this Harley Davidson home and he's kind of like a lot of people. He wanted to go in. He wanted to restore the old Harley. He wanted to get it back to as close as he could to its original. So he starts looking around. He didn't even know what year the Harley Davidson motorcycle was. And so he starts looking for the serial number on it. And finally, he finds the serial number. And he does what most people would do. He calls a Harley-Davidson shop. And he says, hey, I'm just trying to figure out what the year is of this motorcycle. And I think I've got the right serial number. Can I give it to you? And he says, go ahead. Give it to me now. And I'll call you back. So he gives him the serial number. 
In a couple of days, the guy from the Harley Davidson shop calls back. He says, hey, I need you to go back and I need you to check that one more time because I'm not sure you've got the right serial number. So he goes back and he checks it again. He checks it two more times just because the guy from the Harley Davidson shop asked him to. He says, listen, I want you to do one more thing for me. I want you to check one more thing. I want you to raise up the seat, the spring kind of seats that the old Harleys used to have. He said, I want you to raise that up, and I want you to see, is there anything written underneath that seat? He says, hold on, let me check. So he raises up the seat, he moves away the dust, and it says, the king. He says, yeah, actually, I do see some writing here. It says, it's the king. He says, yeah. He says, there were only a few motorcycles made for Elvis Presley and this was one of them. We've been able to find most all of them, but this one was one that we could not find. He says, I will give you $200,000 for it right now. He says, eh, I don't think so. Just a few days later, Jay Leno hears about this story and he calls it. If you don't know Jay Leno, he used to be a part of the Tonight Show. He's also a collector of bikes and, and cars and things like that. He called up the same guy. He says, I'll give you $500,000 for that as is. And the guy said, I think I'll keep it. Now, why do I tell you that story? Here it is. Can you imagine if you were the owner of that little mom and pop resale shop? Can you imagine what a bad deal that you made on that one thing? What a bad decision to make that trade. You didn't maybe know it in the beginning, but later on, man, it hurt. It hurt so bad that he would never forget it after that. He would go to bed night after night, kicking himself for ever making that trade. And as bad of a trade, as bad of a decision that that was, it was nowhere near the, the depth of the bad decision as what David did. A David who traded his reputation. A man who was supposed to be a man after God's own heart. In one night makes a bad decision, a sinful decision that would cost him. And although David could stand before the giants of Goliath, and overcome, it would be this one temptation that would destroy him in that moment. One night of temptation that he could not overcome. So today, what I want us to do is I want us to talk about how important it is for us to find strength in God for the journey that you and I are on so that we can overcome those types of temptations that come our way. Because everybody, you and myself and everybody else in the world will be tested and we have to set our course on that which follows Jesus Christ so we don't let the things that come along along our way of our journey get in the way of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's talk about the three causes of temptation and let's talk about the three cures of temptation this morning. So if you have your Bible and your notes out, why don't you go ahead and grab those out real quick. Let's talk about the causes to begin with. This first one, I thought to myself, if we really wanted to, we would just spend one message on this one cause. It would be enough for us to talk about just the one thing, but we're not going to do that today. We will come back to that at another time when we have, when our structure of our outline is a little bit different. But today I want to talk about the first the three causes, and the first is this. Would you please write this down? The first one is this, compromise. Can I just say that to you again? Compromise. It's when we simply make sin something that is normal. Have you ever found yourself in your life where you were doing things that you knew in the beginning was wrong, but over the course of time, you did it enough, you did it frequently enough that no longer did you drop and say, oh, that feels odd. It felt absolutely normal for you. And that's what happens when you and I get to that point when we begin to compromise. In fact, there are a couple passages of Scripture I just want to read to you that may sound awfully incredibly silly hearing it, but it is exactly what describes compromise. Look at this with me. It comes from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 20. And it talks about this adulterous woman. It says this, This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Can you imagine that? You could set, you could bite it, uh, you could eat, you could wipe your mouth, and you could say, all that I do, nothing is wrong with that. I'm an adulterous woman, but there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. Or you could look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 24, and look at what it says here. Whoever robs their father or mother and says it's not wrong is a partner to the one who destroys now, now let's just stop and use that one little word there, destroys. 
Who is it that destroys? In fact, if you, if you remember, John said that, that, the, that the evil one comes to kill and steal and what? Destroy. So here's the deal. When you think about what happens when you and I compromise to sin, it really comes down to this. That if I sin and I make sin normal in my life, then what we're doing is we're partnering with sin. We become a partner with Satan himself because we make sin normal. We don't see the wrong and right anymore. Now we have become partners with the one who has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. I love the History Channel. There's some really cool things that they show. And one time I remember this story that they were talking about that fits so perfectly with this. The only thing that would make this story better is if this was at, at, at uh, harvest time. Because we're talking about pumpkins. In Africa, there's this, this tribe of Indians. And they don't have guns. And, and the weaponry that they have is not accurate. And, and so one day, they have this, this pond. There's this river that flows through, but off to the side of the river is this little bank that pours out into a pond from that river. And this is where all the ducks come. This is where they eat. And every day, they would do that. So these tribes, these tribesmen had, came up with this idea. They started at the, at the outside, at the front of, the, of where the uh, pond began, and they would float down these pumpkins down through this pond. Now, you can imagine the first time that a pumpkin comes down the pond and all these ducks are there, you know, they're quacking and they're quacking and here comes a, a, a pumpkin and they flee. You know, they fly away. But then they return. And then, so they do this like four and five times. And the, and the ducks, they do exactly the same thing. They just flee. But it's ironic that over a little while, the ducks kind of get used to the pumpkins coming down the pond. And so now they're just sitting around looking around. You know, George is looking at Harry and saying, hey, you look like a pumpkin. No, you're, you're a duck. You know, they don't know the difference. They're just very content. They're very happy with the things that are around them. Once it caused them to flee, but now it causes them to be very content. Now you wonder why I tell you the story. Because it's at that moment that these ducks become content that these Indians will take these pumpkins and they'll carve out a hole in the pumpkin and they'll make little eyes so that they can see and they will go into the water with a pumpkin over their head and a bag in their hand. Do you get the picture of where this is going? So they're walking around slowly in the water, about five feet of water, and they're just slowly getting closer and closer and closer to the ducks with a bag in one hand and their hand reached out and as they're close enough to the duck, they just grab the feet of the duck down under the water into the bag. And that's how they catch the ducks. Now, as crazy and as wild as a story that is, that is exactly what Satan does to you. He will float pumpkins down your path until that becomes so normal and then he's got you right where he wants you. Because that sin that he floats down that is so bad in the beginning that you flee and you run, eventually over time, it becomes so normal that once he got you where he wants you, then he can just bring you under. And that is exactly what sin does. So don't make sin something normal. Don't make it something that, that simply gets you to the point where you don't even think about right or wrong anymore. Now let me tell you something this morning. Jesus was a friend of the sinner. Jesus hung out with the adulterous woman. He hung out with the people that were the, the, uh, the teachers of law. He was there with the, with the tax collectors. But let me tell you something about Jesus that did not happen. He never compromised. He never compromised what he believed and what he stood for. He would love them, but he never compromised the truth. That's who you and I are supposed to be. We are to be the truth to a dark world, but we are never meant to compromise. And folks, this is why I could spend a whole message just talking about how important it is that we don't compromise. Because when you look at the life of the church today, we have compromised an awful lot. And God says, if you want to be a child of the living God who doesn't find themselves struggling like David struggled, let me tell you, you need to realize real quick that there cannot be compromise in your life, that you cannot allow that to take place in you. You can't allow pumpkins to become normal in your journey. The second is this. It's consideration. 
Write that word down. Consideration. It's when once the devil gets you to consider something, then you begin to think it is okay. And here's the deal, folks. And you're willing to think about it, he will set the hook in you immediately. When he can control what goes on up here, he has you right where he wants you. And I thought about how I could talk about this this morning because it's such a touchy thing. But if you look at Abraham and you look at his journey, you, when God called Abraham out, Abraham lived in a place that was full of idolatry. He lived in a place that was full of sin. And you know why that Abraham never turned back to that? Do you know why Abraham didn't go back to thinking, wow, it would be different if I could just go back to where we were. What a great place that it was. You know why he never did? I'm going to give you an example of why. It comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 15. And here's our answer to why he didn't. It says this in verse 15. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, talking about where Abraham came from, they would have had the opportunity to return. But it was because that Abraham did not allow the things to dwell in his mind that he did not set and consider and consider and consider what was back there that he never focused himself about thinking about returning. Now, that may not apply to you, you may think. But think about the nation of Israel. It took God just moments to take Israel out of Egypt. It took him just moments to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. It took a lifetime to get Egypt out of Israel, though, to the point that it took a whole generation that died because they never saw the promised land, because they were always looking back. They were always looking back to what they thought that they had back there. God, in a moment, can take that stuff away from you. He can give you exactly what you need. He can deliver you. But it can sometimes take a lifetime to get Egypt out of your head. And can I just tell you this morning that maybe today there are some of you who have had things on your mind that you've been thinking about. Thinking about relationships. Thinking about things that you know that you ought not to think about. And wondering what if. What if that happened? What if this could happen in my life? What if my wife and I weren't getting along? What if maybe this person over here really would be interested in me? How would I respond? When you consider those things, let me say to you this morning, Satan already has you right where he wants you. I had a friend, and when we were younger, he had this horrible dog that wanted to eat my body. I'm just going to say that for the record. And I chose not to go to his house. We didn't eat at his house. We didn't work out at his house. Because his dog, well, it was satanic. I'm sure that it was. I would ride my bike to school, and that dog would meet me at the road every single day. I carried rocks and sticks, and I wanted to carry a gun, but that wasn't appropriate. But I could not stand his dog. And finally, he said to me, just come over to the house, and I'll tie that dog up. So I said, well, if you'll tie the dog up, I'll come over. So I came over the first night, and we were messing around doing something, and the dog sat there, and he was just barking away, and I knew he wanted my body. And I went home. I thought, well, you know, that wasn't bad. He's on a leash. He's not getting any further. He's not close enough to hurt me. So he said, come over tomorrow night. Let's do some other things. So this went on for like a month, and, and he kept the dog tied up just like he promised he would. And he says, listen, it got to the point where the dog never barked anymore. <laughs> but listen, let me tell you, I want you to know that in my hearts of hearts, I knew that even though he was on a leash and even though he stopped barking every time I came over, I knew if he was ever given the opportunity to consider doing something to me, that dog would. So much so that we finally said, I think the dog will be just fine. I don't think you got to keep tying the dog up anymore. And I came over to his house and he ate my body up. To never to go to that guy's house again. I tell you that only to say, folks, that is exactly what Satan does. He, you, you can tie a dog up and you can hold a dog back and that's you and me. You are the dog. But let me tell you, being given the opportunity to consider something, it may not look like it on the outside, but on the inside, we're thinking about it. On the inside, we're thinking, what would it be like if I could get my hands on that? 
And you know what? I wrote down some things and maybe, maybe this is the right time to think about it. But you ever wonder about how Eve must have felt in the garden? How Eve walked throughout the garden day after day after day. And she saw all those trees that were full of fruit. And she knew it was that one tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that she wasn't supposed to eat. But do you know what changed her mindset? Read the scripture. Go back to the story, and you will find it was the moment that she considered. What would it be like if I did? What if I did eat from that tree? What would happen if I touched that tree? What would happen if I took that beautiful fruit that was on that tree and just take one bite? What would it do? You see, once Satan got her to consider, it forever changed her. And as I think about that, I think about how many times do you and I think about that one thing, and on the outside, it doesn't look like it's there, but oh, on the inside, we're waiting waiting for that opportunity to come as we consider all that we might have, that all that we might do, it's in us. So don't consider those things that are are, are not of God. Don't let those things rest in your mind. The third is this, complacency. You know, we're gonna talk about this right now because it's so important, but we always have to keep an attitude of urgency. Sometimes when we become complacent, you know what happens? We get very, very comfortable with the way life is and we just become happy and normal and everything is good because we are not active. We're not pursuing the things of God. We're not pursuing the things that are a blessing to God and we find ourselves getting in trouble. In fact, Proverbs 6, verse 2 through 5, it says this. You have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself. You want to be free? Here it is. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion, he says, and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of a fowler. If you know that there's something that is wrong in your life, it's not godly. If you know that it's not, then deliver yourself from those things. Deal with it immediately. Deal with it today. That's how important this is. You know, I've had a lot of great people in my lives that I've enjoyed spending time with. I had a friend growing up. He was an older guy back then, and he was a fisherman. And he was one of the best fishermen I had ever seen. He just did things that as I sat there on the bank of a river, I I wouldn't get a bite all day, but this guy caught fish one right after another. And I finally came up to him one day. I said, man, I said, I feel bad. We get together, we go fishing, and I don't catch a thing. How do you do it? He said, well, let me tell you how I do it. I look for the insects that, that, that are around these fish. And I go back to my tackle box And I find lures, I find things that look very close and similar to what the fish are actually eating. And I use those things as my bait. And he says, and then when I when I throw my reel out there, when I when I throw that line out there and they catch it, the the fish think, you know what? Look what I've got. I've got this great thing in my mouth. It is good for me. And, And to be quite honest with you, the way he fished, sometimes he would just let the line go. He would just let the fish swim around until he was ready to pull it in. And you know what? That is exactly what Satan does to you and to me. He'll let you play with it. He'll let you grab it. He'll let you swallow it deep. And you still think you're okay. You're swimming around. You're you're joining everybody else until the time comes that he pulls back. And he says, guess what? I've got you. I got you right where I want you. What sin have you been biting on? What is it that you've been hungry for? That the devil knows that at some point that he'll take you right where he wants you to go. Can I just tell you that when I think about that, I think to myself, how many times have I just got so relaxed and so comfortable with what's around me that I don't even think about whether it's good or bad. Is it just comfortable? Is it good for me? And if it's so, why not take a good old bite? Because it's okay, right? I can go to church. You know what? That's what Satan will do to you too. He'll get you hooked, but he'll let you go to church. He'll let you go. He'll let, you, he'll let that line go out. He'll let you swim around until that moment he's ready. 
to pull you in. That's what Satan does. It's when we compromise. It's when we become uh, so complacent, when we start considering things. That's, that's how temptation interacts with us. That's how sin comes into our lives. And those are just a few of the things. But I've got good news for you this morning because that might be the causes. But thanks be to God that there's a cure for that stuff too. And that's what I want us to focus on in these last few minutes is the cure. The cure for temptation. Now you wonder, were we going to talk about David and Bathsheba? <laughs> well, here it is. If you're following along in your Bibles and you want reference to why we've been talking about this for the last 25 minutes, here's the reason. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we see what caused David to succumb to that temptation that he had with Bathsheba. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse 1, and I want you to look at what happens here. It says this, in the spring... And this is kind of a strange phrase that you and I don't probably think much about, but it was important in David's day. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, there was a time that kings went to war. They were expected to go off to war, folks. And look at what happens. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabah, but David remained in Jerusalem. So the complacency, the, the time just spent enjoying the things that were not what he was supposed to enjoy, the things that he could have been doing but he didn't do. I want you to write this down because this is important. When a time came that David was supposed to be at war, David didn't go. David was supposed to be in the fight. I want you to look at the next verse. One evening then, because of that, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the, of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. So I want you to understand, David lost his heart for war. And some of you who come from a very passive background, you would say, that's a really good thing. But you got to understand that this specific thing was not in the same way in which you think of war. That David was supposed to be about what God was about. David was supposed to be about what God was calling him to do, which was to conquer those who were opposing Israel. And David chose to stay home. That he lost his fight. He lost that thing that he was supposed to be a part of. Sometimes we lose the heart of God and we lose the heart of God's best for our lives. And how many times, how many times have you looked at your marriage and you said, you know what, I don't think it's worth fighting for anymore. Or I don't think my relationship with my kids are worth fighting for anymore because now I just don't feel like it's worth it anymore. And when you lose the fight for God's best in your life, then you lose the battle. And because of David's choice not to go to war, David suffered the consequences and found himself in bed with Bathsheba. Let me give you the cures real quick. The first is this. Don't lose your heart for war because you will get blindsided. You will get blindsided. And by the way, I'm doing this one because I hate the Dallas Cowboys. That's a strong phrase. Sorry, I don't mean hate. I don't really care for the Dallas Cowboys. But let me tell you, in every one of our lives, there comes a time where we no longer have the same passion and the same fire for that which we're called to do. For some of you, you know what that's like in your journey with Jesus Christ, where in the early time, you were hungry, you were eager about being a part of what God has called you to do. And then there comes this time, isn't there, where you get comfortable, when you get complacent, when you get compromising, that you start to think of things a little bit differently. And you no longer have that same fire, that same desire that you once did. Can I show you a quick little video clip? This is a clip, before you show it, this is a little clip of what happens in the first moment when you're fighting the war and you're doing what you're supposed to do. But then, you get complacent. And you start thinking about other things. And before you know it, you've lost what you gained. You lost what you thought that you had, all because of one bad choice. Take a look at this video. We have celebration and warmth. I'll give you the rest of it after this play. Fourth down and six. 
And right fumbles, picked up by Lee. There's the fight. There's the battle. It's a six Look at that big man go. He's being chased by BB. What's out? Can I give you the bad news? He never scored a touchdown. Because he started looking around. And you know what he started doing? He started thinking about himself rather than what was going to be for the team. And what was going to be a touchdown turned into a safety. And it cost him big time. Leon Lett is the gentleman's name. You know, in his great career as a defensive lineman, he never lived down that specific thing. And by the way, you may not know this. This happened in the Super Bowl. The game of all games. The thing that you fought so hard for. The thing that you longed so hard to achieve. And in a split moment, when you get complacent, it can all be stripped away. And that happens to you. And it's sad enough when it happens in a football game. But imagine what happens when it's in real life. Imagine when it happens to you. And that thing that you once saw is so meaningful, so powerful for your life, just gets stripped away. That's what happens. So don't lose the fight for the war. Here's the second thing that you need to understand too. Establish unshakable convictions in your life. You need to establish those unshakable convictions that you have in your life. Those biblical convictions that you say, I will not cross the line. Can I tell you why? Because otherwise you will experience the greatest temptation where you are the weakest in your convictions. You will suffer the greatest temptations in those areas where you have the weakest convictions in your life. Now there's a lot of things that we could talk about here, but I just want to talk about just a few this morning. You need to settle those things in your life. You need to decide whether or not you believe in sex before marriage or what you should watch on TV or what you allow your eyes to see or where you allow yourself to go and what do you allow yourself to do. Because if you don't settle those things in your heart and in your mind, I promise you it is in those places where you don't settle it that you will be tempted the most and you will be found weak because you're not standing on a solid ground. You're standing on something that is gray and you can go either way with it. Let me tell you, there's a lot of areas that I could find myself so easily being tempted in. But there's some things that are not. Amen. I was telling my class this morning, how dare me say this out loud? Thus I would fall. But I grew up in a home where I watched adultery over and over and over and over again in my parents. And then because of that, I set very strict, very strong standards for what I believe biblically about a relationship between a husband and a wife that it should never pass. A relationship should never go beyond that relationship with anybody else. And for me, I settled that. Let me tell you. I pray every day for it, but I want you to know I settled that a long time ago. I will never allow my wife to experience the pain of adultery because of my actions. That does not mean that there's not other things that you and I or myself can fall in. But let me tell you what, when you settle those things, it is so hard for Satan to get a grip in those places. So you have to settle those things for yourself. I, I, I don't think I've got enough time, but let me just move on because I, there's another story I want to share with you, but it's just our time's not there. But here's what you need to know. In those things where you say, well, I'm not sure if that's such a big deal. Watch. Because it's in those places where Satan will grab a hold of you. And before you know it, he's pulling you right in where you need to be. So, don't lose sight of the war. Don't lose your passion for it. Establish those unshakable convictions in your life. And here's the third thing. When you trip up, choose repentance. When you trip up, and you will... And I will choose repentance. When sin comes, you need to come back to him. When sin, co sin comes into your life, you need to turn back to him. Your heart has to want to be godly. You know where my mistakes was early on in my journey? Is it wasn't so much that I wanted to be godly. I just wanted to be forgiven. God says to you and I, the goal is that you and I should desire to be godly, not just to be forgiven. Why do I say that? Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and he tells us that. Specifically, he says it. He says, in, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. Look at that again. He says, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials 
and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. The godly is that which you and I must choose. It's not just so that you and I can say, well, man, I am so glad I'm forgiven. We should desire it because we want to become godly. We want to have a closer relationship with him. We want to be like him. It ought not to be just so that we can get off the hook. It ought to be because we want to become godly. So here's the answer to the question that we've been talking about since the beginning of this morning. So why do we need a Bathsheba? <laughs> well, let me tell you why. I think I can explain it in two ways. I had a professor. He was a great professor. and He loved Jesus with all of his heart. This is what you knew about him. Every week as we would study, it was a, it was a history class. And every week as we would study through each chapter, he would say, highlight this because this will be on the test. Highlight this, this will be on the test. There would be 20 questions every single week and every question we knew what was coming. And every week you knew that there was going to be a test. And so I would diligently study because I knew that the time would come that I would be taking a test and that was a given. That was absolutely fact. Can I tell you not to brag, I missed one question in the entire class. Out of all the tests that we took, one question, and you know why? Because I decided that if I, if I know if I know that there is going to be a test, I need to be prepared for the test to come. And he did that not just so he could give me a test. It wasn't just so that I would be tested. He wanted me to be prepared for the test that came. He wanted me to succeed. He wanted me to do better. That's why God allows us to be tested. He wants you to grow in him. He doesn't want you to be complacent. He doesn't want you to compromise. He doesn't want you to consider those things. He wants you to find those biblical principles, trust in him, draw closer to him, so that when those times, and they will come, that you are tested, that you are ready to pass the test. He never says, oh, I can't wait to watch Job suffer and fall short of the glory of God. He says, consider my, my servant Job, who is righteous. Do you know why he called him righteous? Because Job was in love with his almighty God. And he followed him every day. He made sacrifices for his sons and daughters just in case they sinned. That's how Job looked at it. He took those things seriously. He took the word of God seriously. I had other classes that never had a test. It was pass or fail only, one of the two. And if I'm going to be very honest with you, when you're in a class where it's just a pass or fail kind of situation, how often do you find yourself studying like there's no tomorrow? Not very often. Because you know. But my teacher knew that if he held truth that every week he would give us a test, he knew that for the most part, if we really wanted to pass, we would study because the test would come our way. I'm going to close with this story and then we'll be done. I know that we're getting close to the end of our time. I had a teacher in seventh grade. His name was Mr. Hoover. And lots of you know Mr. Hoover. If you went to Wakarusa Middle School, he was a tremendous teacher. And he taught math. And of all the subjects that I suffered and struggled in the most, it was math. Oh, how I hated math. But he made math more interesting than any teacher I ever knew. And I cannot tell you the number of days that we would have a test and he would walk up and down each and every row looking over our shoulder, looking at our questions, looking at how we were answered. Not that he was cheating by giving us the answer, but let me tell you what he would do. I would say he had a very good singing voice and he used music as a way to help us to learn. And sometimes he would use the words and sometimes he would just kind of sing it. Now, he's got these good sized lips, you know, and he can make, you know, the, it's almost like singing out of an instrument. He could just, blah, 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 you know, and it just comes out so nice. And I remember one day as I was taking a math test and he walked by and he looked down and he says, hmm. And he started singing this little thing. And I'm thinking, what? He goes, Dave, think about it. Divide the top by the bottom and what do you get? And you know, he wasn't doing that to give me the answer. He was reminding me that the test is important 
and I need to remember what all I have learned from him. And he would go up to the chalkboard and he would do the exact same thing. Not with the question that I'm answered, but he would just take a, a, another example and just show it while everybody's taking the test. Do you know, some people would say, oh, I think that he was trying to get the answers to the kids so that they could pass the test. No. He just didn't want to see us fail. He just wanted us to succeed. He wanted us to do well. And can I tell you this morning, that's exactly who your Heavenly Father is. <laughs> He wants you to succeed. He wants you to do well. And there will be tests along the way. And those tests will help you. But you need those Bathsheba moments so that you can lean on him. That you can stand firm in the things that you know. We need the Nathans and the Jonathans and we need the Goliaths because in those moments, it draws us closer to rather than away from the one that we love the most. At the end of the day, all that does is push us to love him more. Not to hate him, but to appreciate him and care for him and love him more than we did before. All because we trust in him. His statutes, his, his commands for our lives every single day. God, I don't understand. And yeah, that person over here, that would be interesting, God. But you know what? I'm fighting for this. I'm not going to lose my battle on the things that you care for the most. I'm going to care for my marriage. My kids, man, God, I don't know if I can get through to them, but you know what? I know what you command me to do, and I'm going to do that. I'm not going to stop the fight for that. I'm not going to get complacent, and I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to fight the battle the way you called me to fight. And I want you to know that when that happens, and when we trust in that, the battles are won every single time. God has a way of taking us through those things in the midst of such terrific and horrible things. You know, David came back to the Lord. You know that. You know that he did. When Nathan approached him and he said, I have sinned against God. That's what David said. And you know why? Because he trusted the statutes of God. He was willing to admit when he was wrong. He trusted. And he knew that God cared enough for him that he'd always open his arms and say, yeah, good lesson. Now come back to me. Please don't leave today thinking that Pastor Dave said that you and I should go out and find Bathsheba tomorrow. Because if you do, my wife is not going to be very happy about that. And secondly, I don't, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that those Bathsheba moments will come. In different ways and in different forms, it will come. And when it comes, how you prepare yourself in advance will determine how you do win the battle or lose the battle. It is up to you now to do the right thing. So would you stand with me this morning? Let's sing praises to him today. Let's thank him for the fact that we do serve such a loving God who cares about your journey, cares about your life, cares about the trials that you're going to go through. So that you and I can look on the other side of Bathsheba and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for keeping my mind focused on the battle. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to keep my heart where it needs to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving me that much. Let's sing together this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, there's lots of different groups of people that really need to hear this today. Some of you are youth and, and you're going into a transition of life and you're going to hear from other people and they're going to tell you their viewpoints and they're going to tell you that maybe what you've grown up believing really isn't all that accurate and maybe it's not even true. And unless you have settled those things in your heart, unless you've settled those foundational biblical truths, when the time comes, that temptation will be to walk away, and you will. And you need to settle that now. You need to do that today. For some of you who are parents, understand this, that you bring your kids to church every single Sunday. You want them to hear the Word of God. But please hear my heart when I say that if they don't see it lived out in you at home, if you're watching, you're doing, you're part of things that you ought not to be, your children see that. They know and it will have no meaning in their life at all if you don't settle those things. 
And all the church going and all the nights that you put them involved in things at church will not matter if you don't settle those things. For some of you who are grandparents, (laughs) you kind of lost touch. You kind of stepped away from that relationship with your children and your grandchildren. And let me tell you, you are so valuable to them today. They need to see that you believe in something. Even later on in life, those things really do matter to you. It's valuable to you. Even as you go into those twilight years, it matters to you. They need to know that. But it doesn't happen until we settle it. And so this morning, before we pray, as I've spoken to some youth and some parents and some grandparents today, Maybe there's some of you who are here today and you would say, Pastor, I know that maybe some of the things that I have heard, I've not really settled it for me yet. Oh, I hear what people say, but maybe I haven't said, I'm sticking a stake in the ground right here. I'm drawing a line in the sand and I will not cross. Maybe you're that parent who said, you know what? I've watched things and I've done things and I've let my kids see it. And yet here I am with them every Sunday. And I need to get that right for me too. And for some of you who are grandparents, you need to decide now to check back in. To get back involved because you don't know how important you are to their lives. If that's you today and you say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I would have the courage to take a stand, to to get back into the fight? to draw that line in the sand, to stop compromising, to stop being complacent, stop considering things that are not good for me, that I might begin to make that change today so that God might look back and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If that's you today, would you raise your hand and put it right back down and I'll pray for you. I see your hand. I see it. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, Father, how grateful we are that your word reminds us so clearly of the path that we are to take, the standard that we're to set, the, the line that we dare not cross for a reason. Father, it is for our good. Somehow, Father, we have grown to believe that by holding back and, 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 and withdrawing ourselves from things that somehow we're going to miss out on life. But Father, when we draw that line of sand and we draw close to you, it is in that moment we receive life, that we enjoy life, that there's peace in our lives. More is not better. (laughs) Truth is better. Trusting in you is better than all those other things. Lord, we don't want Satan to, to get us to believe it's okay. It's just so that he can take a hold of our feet and bring us under. Father, help us each day. Help us, Lord, to always be mindful of the tasks before us, the plans that you have for us, that we would not compromise, but Lord, that we would stand firm, not just in church on Sunday, but at work on Monday. And each and every day that follows, Lord, we give that to you. We trust in you today. And it's in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, that we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord today.